Hi everyone and welcome back once again to Bissa's room. My name is Bissa Ray and this is my room. Thank you so much for joining. We are gonna be hanging out and having a lot of fun. Plan for today is we're gonna do a little bit of a what I am watching roundup. This is going to be everything from TV to movies as well as sports television that I enjoy talking about. I would absolutely love to hear in the comment section below what you're interested in, shows that you're watching, I'm just a girl and there's only so much that I can really get into, but I am truthfully a TV junkie. I have always been a TV junkie. I definitely don't want to be missing anything if there are some standout moments that I need to check out. Before we get into today's topic, I do want to give a quick shout out to this wonderful hat that I am wearing. I actually picked up this hat at the Milwaukee Public Museum. I frequent often. I absolutely love going to museums and just supporting the these local public spaces that are encouraging of learning and growth and healthy, safe activities outside of the bar scene, which so often can be so predominant, especially living here in Wisconsin, the country's drunkest state. I was there the other week and I saw this really wonderful hat. It says, you are on stolen land. It is created by urban native era. And I just absolutely had to pick it up. I think it is important to acknowledge that we are currently on stolen land. Native genocide, indigenous genocide is a very real thing that not nearly enough people are talking about or being educated about. I think there's a lot of misconceptions over the reality of the genocide that has occurred in this country. Get educated, inform yourself. We have a responsibility, especially as folks who occupy native land to do our research and inform ourselves, particularly so we can start to take steps towards reparation and towards healing the very deep wounds that we have created. With that being said, I also think it's important for me to acknowledge right away Free Palestine. I believe we are 125 days into the current conflict that is happening in Gaza. The devastation that continues to go on there is completely unacceptable and it is imperative that we land at a ceasefire as soon as possible. It should have already happened. And it's something that I think is important to continue to bring to the forefront of people's minds, despite it being an uncomfortable topic and something that people seem to want to shy away from. This devastation is happening real time. Innocent men, women, and children continue to be killed. With that being said, move forward with love. So getting into today's topics, I'm really excited about this one because like I said, I am very much a TV junkie. And so there is a lot to get into. I'm gonna go ahead and just admit right now, I personally have always been a reality TV girly. So that is a lot of what I have been watching recently. Starting off today, I wanna start by talking about Love Island UK All Stars. We are wading deeper and deeper into the season. And I have to say, I am kind of longing for traditional Love Island to return. I was very interested initially when they announced the All-Stars season to see what the dynamics were like, see some familiar faces come back. But as we are in the point of the season, I am feeling kind of exhausted by Love Island All-Stars, if I'm being totally honest. But I think a lot of the charm of the show has been kind of lost, unfortunately. I think there definitely have been some interesting dynamics, but at the end of the day, it just feels kind of tired and I'm really longing for fresh faces. I feel like Love Island Games, which was another new rendition of the show that premiered a few months back, was something that was exciting and fresh and kind of is the version of Love Island All-Stars that I prefer. The competition aspect of it just allows for there to be more of a clear driving force behind the show. You don't have to put so much pressure on the relationships. And I think the competitive aspect of it just keeps it a lot more fresh and a lot more fun. I think bringing in people across different franchises not only brings a certain level of intersectionality from an international global scale, but also just a lot of fun and a lot of different views viewerships that can all kind of come and participate. Now, what I will say is I am just an American girly. I'm sure that there is some merit 
and validity to being someone who lives in the UK. But what I'll also say is I've been watching Love Island since season one, and I know all these characters. I've seen them play the game. And unfortunately, it just reads as kind of disingenuous and ultimately, like I said, tiresome. We will see how things play out. If I'm being completely honest, I'm reaching a point where I'm kind of tired of watching. I don't know if I'm gonna finish the season and I would love to, but I don't know if it's worth my time. And it seems like the same dramas are just playing over and over again and I am over it. Now, moving on to the other side of the coin, a reality TV show that I've also been watching for a fair amount of time, Bachelor season 28. We are officially three episodes in and I have to say I have been loving it. It has been so much fun to see this new version of The Bachelor kind of stepping into the spotlight. When I say that, I think Mike Fleisch, who is the owner of the franchise, ultimately ended up parting ways with them this previous year. And I think you can really feel a new fun and fresh aspect coming in, especially in the care and attention to detail with production. The season itself has just been so much fun to watch. I think it helps when you have such a desirable bachelor, Joey with the sparkly eyes. I like to call him AI bachelor just because he is maybe too good to be true, but it's just been a lot of fun to watch. There's so many beautiful, talented, interesting women, all of the Maria Sydney drama that has been going on has been very entertaining. I'm very excited for the double episode next week. I am excited to see what happens with this two-on-one. And it also, as much as it feels like a fresh and new rendition of the Bachelor franchise, I'll also say, I think that there is just like a return to home happening with the two-on-one dynamic. It feels like the stakes are high. It feels like people really are ready to fall in love. And also people are hesitant and fearful of getting involved in the drama because they don't want to mess with their relationship with Joe. And I think that just goes to show what a strong choice it was to cast him as The Bachelor. Higher caliber group of women, higher caliber stakes. And so far, it's just been a home run in my book. And I've been watching the show for a long time. I think there's been a lot of speculation about its cancellation. Is it feeling stale? But I would argue that this season goes to prove that we are moving into yet another new era of bachelorism. And I am excited to see as things continue. Now, the last of my reality TV picks for today is going to be Love on the Spectrum. It's one that I just kind of accidentally stumbled across with my Netflix subscription. It wasn't one that I was anticipating watching, but I actually did really enjoy it. I felt like it was a lot of fun. I have a sister who is disabled. I called her and talked to her on the phone. And when we spoke about it, she said she wants a Love on the Spectrum, um, but for a wider range of disabled folks. So Netflix, I'm looking at you. I would love to see that. I think in general, the disabled community or the lesser abled body community can feel quite invisible, especially in mainstream media. Often you see in Hollywood, non actually disabled folks being cast to play disabled characters. It may not seem like something that is a big deal, but to the disabled community, these things mean a lot. And I think Love on the Spectrum is kind of just an interesting version of that focusing on the neurodivergent community as someone who identifies a little bit with neurodivergence, certainly not to the scale of the characters on the show. I think there is something really charming and relatable to a lot of the characters. I think it's easy to laugh and have fun um, seeing these outward large emotions being displayed for situations that sometimes maybe feel quite normative, but can be kind of overwhelming and can be overwhelming to the average person. I feel like oftentimes watching these characters, they are saying things that often feel like my inner monologue and I really appreciate that and I am definitely looking forward to the third season coming out continuing to follow these characters and honestly rooting for them to find love I love watching dating reality tv shows because I think I've always loved a happy ending and despite the fact that a lot of these characters unfortunately do not find love still a lot of fun and definitely one I would recommend tuning into okay the next one on my list I need I need to take a deep breath, okay? Take, take a deep breath with me. <sighs> Good, I'm feeling grounded, I'm feeling calm. Hopefully we're on the same plane. The show I'm about to talk about is old news to anyone who probably cares. Let me preface this by saying I am relatively new to the anime world. I have really only watched a couple, maybe three shows in 
their full entirety. It can be quite daunting. And sometimes admittedly, I struggle having an attention span that is, I don't know, aligned with 500 episodes of Bleach or whatever your anime of choice is. In the past year, I started watching Hunter Hunter with my brother and absolutely fell in love. Fell in love with the characters, fell in love with Gon, fell in love with Killua, fell in love with Hisuka, believe it or not, his pervy ass. All of them, all of them. Uh, just so much fun storytelling, so much fun adventure, and, and a lot of just really beautiful world building, which is something that I've always appreciated in storytelling in general, in books that I read, and of course, getting into anime and just seeing how wonderfully creative and exciting a lot of this writing can be. Now, with that being said, we we were pretty religiously watching Hunter Hunter from the beginning and things really hit a wall when we started the Chimera Ant arc. Now, before the real Hunter Hunter heads come for me, I know a lot of people say that this is their favorite arc. And to that, I would like to respond and say, are you confused with length and quality? Because it is the longest arc by a mile. I want to say the Chimera Ant arc is as long as the first three arcs combined or just about that long. And we watched it. We watched, I want to say maybe 10 or 15 episodes into the Chimera Ant arc. And it was so challenging for me to get into it and just completely abandon kind of the rules and understanding of what the show had been uh, for this new like doomsday narrative that we were kind of seemingly being thrust into with not really a whole lot of explanation outside of this very fast storytelling that they were doing to try to justify such a major change in the show. What I can say now is we are about 10 or 15, no, no, no. We are only 10 episodes now out from finishing the Chimera Ant arc. I'm not gonna give any spoilers. If you haven't watched Hunter Hunter, please go check it out. It is available on Netflix for sure. I believe it might also be available on Hulu. Such a fun show, such a lighthearted show. I mean, there's definitely high stakes, but the characters are so lovable. I think there's just a lot of really wonderful stakes and a lot of just playful, fun writing and world building. Everything that I said, I stand on. I just don't think the Chimera Ant arc is doing it for me. I'm sorry to say. I feel like the pacing struggles. It's hard not to feel like it is just a lot of filler where realistically, I think that there is such a beautiful and much more easy and interesting pace to the front half of the show. The overall evolution of the ants and also the information that they're giving us about these characters and specifically about the ants, it often just feels contradictory to me. And it's been hard not feeling frustrated watching it because it just irks me to my core. We had a crazy Hunter Hunter marathon a couple days ago where we were just powering through all of these episodes. They're storming the palace. We're watching all of these battles ensue. And yet here we are less than 10 episodes away from finishing this arc. And I still am kind of sat here wondering what it was all for. So if I have any avid Chimera Ant arc defenders in the audience, please comment below. Please tell me what I'm missing. Please tell me the secret sauce that you know that I need to know because I will continue to encourage people to watch Hunter Hunter. I will continue to point it out as something just like really enjoyable and really easy to watch. They're 20 minute episodes, so it's very consumable despite there being a lot of episodes. But realistically, the Chimera Ant arc is not it at least not for me. I'm excited to finish the show. I'm excited to see how things kind of are wrapping up. I think I definitely want to go back and, and rewatch the first four arcs, but um, I don't know if, if I will be watching the Chimera Ant arc again. Now, gonna get into switching gears just a little bit. <laughs> I have become quite the Milwaukee Bucks fan in my time here living in Milwaukee this past year specifically. I've been here for seven years, but living with my brother, he is an avid basketball fan and we find ourselves talking about basketball, the Bucks, the NBA quite a bit. I do also want to give out a shout out to Kobe. We just passed the anniversary of his death 
rest in peace, a legend, such an amazing player and such an incredible loss, obviously to the city of LA, but also to everyone who got the pleasure of seeing him and the impact that he had both on the game and outside of the game. Getting into a little bit of Bucks chat, Bucks news, some takes that I have, some things that we've been talking about a lot. Doc Rivers, new head coach, goodbye Adrian Griffin. At this point, it feels probably a little bit like old news. What I will say is it has not been the smoothest run for Doc Rivers. Uh, we've been on the road. We've been facing a number of injuries. I am still a little bit salty about that Chris Middleton KD matchup, watching him step in his landing zone twist the ankle it was, it's tough to watch it's tough to look at I think it will be very interesting to see as the season kind of continues to play out there's obviously still a lot of basketball that needs to be played and I'm excited to get into the all-star games as well but I think it will be interesting to see how this new version of the Bucks jives with new leader at the head I think these first five games are just a transition zone being on the road is tough um, but I think there's a lot of time for things to kind of still come together and I still continue to feel very hopeful about the potential of a championship run we, as of yesterday, traded away campaign for the Pat Beverly option instead. I think I'm excited about having a strong defensive player. Saw a little mock-up of Vance in a Bucks jersey. He looks like he was made for it. So I'm excited to see if Pat Bev's influence on the Bucks is going to make us stronger in our defensive play and hopefully, again, put us in a position where we can take that chip. Uh, last but not least, uh, we got to give a farewell to to Robin Lopez, no greater joy than to watch Brooke Lopez absolutely acting shocked on the court while Robin Lopez is sitting on the ground looking like he doesn't have a thought in his head. Such a funny guy. I can't say I'm overly gonna miss him on the team. Mans was reading a book for his last game in Milwaukee, but I did wanna give him a shout out for the crazy fro twin. Last but not least, I've got a couple of movies that I do want to highlight for today. For starters, I'm going to start with a Disney classic. As I told you in my last video, I did unfortunately have to walk away from my job. So I'm currently out of work. I was feeling really sad about that. I was feeling really upset about that. And in an effort to cheer me up, my sweet, sweet brother did decide to put on a movie. We decided together that we were going to watch Sky High. It's one that I have not seen in in years to be honest with you guy high is such a classic for me it's such a fun childhood flick that i have always enjoyed one of those that we had on dvd that we would watch religiously on road trips and just kind of see endless amounts of times it's one that even now probably 10 years since i've seen it last maybe longer i still have those lines and those scenes and those things memorized so an absolute classic and absolutely helped cheer me up on what was a very very rough night what is a disney or childhood classic that you like to go to that makes you feel good i know the harry potter movies are another collection that always just kind of make me feel cozy make me feel at home and that have just kind of like endless rewatch value also what is the best harry potter movie it's a loaded question i'm not sure i have an answer for you i think my most watched Harry Potter movie is the third. But as far as my favorite goes, I love the fourth. I love the sixth. This is a tangent. Let me know in the comments below. And then the last thing that I want to mention a week or two ago, a couple weeks ago, I believe, I did go to see Poor Things in the theater. It was kind of like a cold watch for me. I really went in with not too much knowledge really of what the movie was going to be at all. I was definitely shocked and caught off guard by the amount of nudity and sex that was happening. It definitely is quite a crude film with a very harsh and brutal outlook on the female and feminine existence. And I can understand why they are struggling with facing a lot of criticism in regards to the male gaze. I think the character that Emma Stone plays is constantly being subjected to the male gaze. But in that same breath, I think most women are being subjected to the male gaze constantly. 
And as much as I would love to live in Greta Gerwig's Barbie world, that's just free from the patriarchy. That's not reality. And despite the fact that this movie is set in what feels like a very romantic and again, wonderfully created world that they build, that she travels through and you get to see many facets of, I think there's a lot of really beautiful reflection of what you see in the real world, just all over this film. From a cinematic standpoint, it's beautiful to look at. The costuming is inspired, truly, truly exciting to see. I was always looking forward to see kind of like what the next frame was going to hold from a visual standpoint. And ultimately, I think that there is a lot of room for important conversation to be had when it comes to this film. I'm not going to make a definitive decision one way or another about its meaning or how others should receive it, but I do think it is worth a watch, just maybe not one to watch with mom and dad. <laughs> that is going to wrap up my roundup today. Lots that I got into. Thanks for sticking around if you have made it this far. I do just want to close out today's video with an affirmation. I had therapy this morning and I'm always working to be kinder to myself and to hold more space for myself, more kindness for myself, more grace for myself. So with that being said, today's affirmation, I am worthy of good things. I am open and ready to accept abundance. And I hope you know those things are true for you as well. Thank you so much for coming back and joining me for the second episode of Bissa's Room. My name is Bissa Ray, and I will hang with you next time. Bye. <laughs> Surely you didn't really think I would still be down.